Mark Atatürk. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mamluks podcast. My name is Sim. Along with me are my co-hosts, Sheikh Hamer and Hello. Mort. Um, before the show gets started, I just wanted to give a clarification, uh, correction, as they say, you know, keeping ourselves honest. On the last show on Wednesday, we were talking about uh, the Aqeen Institute not talking about uh, the whole LGBT thing. Uh, several of our listeners had pointed out to us that there were multiple articles and videos that were published uh, regarding that subject and as a point of clarification we want to make sure that uh, we make that correction that there are multiple uh, messages from Yaqeen Institute about that so let no one ever say that the Madman Mooks don't ever own up to their mistakes uh, we do and we will own up to it uh, whenever that happens and it'll happen a lot in the future because we do stuff that's live we don't have those you know those youtube videos where it's like cut out like every second like <laughs> the, all the uhs and ums yeah. and let me look at look it up in the in the book and yeah, sort yeah. it out we don't have those little cutscenes uh, all compiled together with completely accurate information so it's going to happen we apologize to anyone who was hurt we have multiple friends in yaqeen institute we're friends with mahmoud hijab and all those other brothers who uh, you know seem to have disagreements and uh we just try to sort it out anyway uh back to the show we have a wonderful guest for you guys someone who i consider one of our ideologues you know he's you know we have like people like mubin ved and uh uh who else um uh the the, the Harfush. brother ali Harfush and uh Bassam, you know yeah. those guys uh we love them all we have i have so many others but uh, please don't kill me if i don't mention you mm -hmm. but um brother uh mustafa kabani he's a lecturer writer translator a poet um a man of multiple talents uh too many to mention he's the royal director sorry director of the <laughs> royal <laughs> What are you with a royal director? <laughs> Let's just call him the royal director. The royal director. <laughs> the director of the Royal Islamic Strategic Study yeah. Center. Study Center. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Brother Mustafa, it is indeed. Welcome to the show. Um, do you, so when, when you're at a royal uh, facility such as that, do they treat you like that? Are you, uh, you but, know? I, I saw you had they an definitely AV. don't treat me like royalty. Um, <laughs> but hey, and, you, uh, you have an AV you know, guy. I have a an an audiovisual guy who were who helped you get set up before the show. Uh, yeah, he's my neighbor. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I I thought you were at the at the institute or something right now. Oh no, I, I would never be so pompous as to uh, pose with books behind me. But he just figured it would be uh, it would be nice for the effect. So I, I, I just no, it's a very I nice just humored him. Mashallah, yeah. it's a very nice effect and a love lesson for helping you out, brother. Alhamdulillah, yeah, barakallah fi. Oh, barakallah. Um, well, uh, brother Mustafa, um, there's a lot going on, and uh, we we brought you on the show because uh, well, one of the most uh, um, at least appealing reasons to kind of bring you on the show is because of the recent articles with um, the Middle East Eye publishing things about um, Sheikh Nu and his, um, um, some of the allegations of abuse in re related to that whole, um, it's a compound or, you know, um, the it's, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's not really a compound. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a neighborhood. A neighborhood. And uh, I mean, just, just to clarify, there are actually Christians who live in this neighborhood. So, yeah. um, you know, people have a, a, a misunderstanding that somehow uh, this neighborhood is, you know, signed a, sort of like a commune or a compound or gated off or, or something like that. Um, and uh, it isn't, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a neighborhood of, uh, 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 it's called Hayal Kharabsha. It's in, uh, in sports city. And, you know, I, I think I just want to summarize uh, these complaints in a few statements. And they are, when I become caliph uh, 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 one day, uh, libeling people for things that you can sue them for will become, will be illegal. Either sue someone or, pardon me, shut up. 
Uh, mm. If you really have a case against the person, then sue them or call the cops at the very least. And uh, merely, you know, writing these articles, it's just an it's, it's basically an Islamic extension or a, an excuse of a journalistic extension of cancel culture. Please, if you have a case, contact the authorities. Otherwise, you're just trying to cover up. I'm, I'm speaking to the people who wrote these articles. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to cover up the fact that you were failed parents and failed husbands. Like, you know, that, that's basically the summary. Mm. If you have a case, call, call the police. I like and, it. Uh, and even the Middle East guy, um, you know, I really lost a lot of respect for them when they tried to uh, drag uh, Prince Ghazi into this. He has nothing to do with this. His case is always, if you have a, uh, his, his statement is always, if you have a case, then call the police. Uh, uh, discuss it with the authorities. Otherwise, you know, there's no one that has any special treatment. We're all under Jordanian law here. Well, that's, that's, that's well, basically just the, the summary. Well, a lot of, a lot of those uh, people would might say that, you know, uh, the police in Jordan wouldn't care much about, you know, disciplining kids with uh, physical abuse. Um, so there, this is why we had to take the approach to, that we did. I'm not saying it's the right thing to say, but this is yeah. what they would respond with no it's not it's not true disciplining children is illegal there's uh there's al-usra there's the uh the uh, the branch of the police that is uh, specifically uh connected to protecting families and i called the police on on the school fatua um so that's my claim to shame um and uh, you know what happened to me in the, in this neighborhood absolutely nothing i still interact with sheikh Nuh. i still uh interact with um Sahel. Um, and, uh, you know, things are, things are fine. I called the police on the school when I had, uh, when I had concerns and they weren't being heard and, uh, you know, life goes on. Well, I, I, yeah, what's one of the, those things it's, um, it's strange because it seemed like, you know, uh, well, one of those, some people who you, you had mentioned in your, uh, Facebook post regarding the subject was that some of the people who were complaining were his most, um, almost extreme supporters. They're people who had um, completely relegated their thinking and their, mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you called it the surrogate brain. They, want, yeah. they wanted someone who just did all the thinking for them. And these were the people who were the most uh, uh, supportive of me at they, least in an extreme way. And yeah. now they, they're like complaining. So tell us a little bit about that. They were essentially they were essentially Stepford Murids, you know, the, the Stepford wives. <laughs> uh, so these were, these were like the Stepford Murids and, uh, when I sent this, uh, my write-up to a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, Canadian who used to live in the high, um, and he told me two things, uh, and, and, and I'm guilty on both charges. He says, number one, you think you're smarter than everyone else. <laughs> guilty as charged. Um, <laughs> because I basically said, you know, I, I put up that meme where that, uh, where that kid is looking at the butterfly, and uh, the, uh, the kid, written underneath it is corruptions, people who live in corruption, <laughs> and then the butterfly is thinking, and then the question is, is this halal? It's like, you know, you made no effort to think. Uh, and I'm not talking about uh, smarter or dumber as uh, uh, physical abilities. I'm talking about, uh, as Bonhoeffer referred uh, to stupidity, as an immoral choice. They chose not to use their brains. They chose to sit by and, uh, and watch uh, as things were happening. And now they're making up for it by writing this, uh, by, uh, by writing this, uh, this terrible long article. So guilty as charged, I am smarter than them. And I'm not talking about IQ. I'm talking about that I chose to use my brain. Um, number two, he said, well, you know what? Um, he said, and the guy's like, he, he's a friend of mine, but he, he's also uh, quite frank. He said, uh, you were always at the bottom of the barrel in terms of what he's like, no one wanted to be like you. You know what I mean? You were perceived as being like, like, like you were a failure as a Sufi. Um, and, and I story. You know, it, yeah, exactly. You know, there, there are people who are mentally retarded and there are people who are spiritually retarded. I, I, I fit into the, into the <laughs> latter category. Um, and, and I'm okay awesome. with that. Um, you know, and, and, and you know, it's it, so he he got uh, so he, he basically uh, uh, addressed my issues with, with those two points. And so what I'm saying is that uh, you had a lot of people who were basically um, who were whenever i would discuss issues uh, whenever i would discuss anything bring anything up in a group i was removed from groups i was told to shut up i was told to stop making a fitna you know what i'm the guy who walks into work 
flips people off, tells them they suck and quits. These people were the types who work for uh, uh, for for ten years, never making a complaint, and then one come uh, one day come in and shoot everyone. It's like, <laughs> why didn't you guys just say something? You know, uh, while we were while these things were happening, instead of waiting all this time. Well, it was so, convenient. Like, yeah. So so most of real yeah. quick. So some of our audience is not really familiar with the whole shenanigan or whatever it is, the whole event that's happening. Can you maybe just kind of recap? Because uh, I think I think that will probably help the listeners understand exactly what we're speaking about here. If you don't mind doing that, uh, I mean, a lot of it, uh, a lot of what was in the Middle East Eye and later in the Muslim Matters article is, uh, you know, it's, it's a series of allegations, and I can't comment on what I didn't see or what I don't know, right? And so there were claims that, you know, uh, these claims of child abuse uh, sound far more sinister than they actually, um, uh, uh, than what actually happened. What happened was some spanking. Was it, if it, if that spanking was beyond the, uh, the limits of the Sharia, then no one can defend that. End of discussion, right? Uh, there was also, I mean, there were some people who were running the school who were, you know, they seemed to have really deep set problems and they were a bit messed up. And, and so there was emotional damage. There was um, uh, uh, there was psychological damage. And what I know is that Sheikh Nuh dealt with that capably. OK, that's all I know. So, so, so just to be clear, these allegations, are they made against Sheikh Nuh himself or is it people under him or how does that work? I mean, uh, who are they accusing it this of? Matters what allegations, you know, it, it's like if you look at the Muslim Matters article, it starts with the definition of spiritual abuse. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot be part of a Sufi tariqa without being subject to such spiritual abuse. Like yeah. what? What planet do these people come from? If they, if you, I can't remember. If, if if someone wants to be so kind as to dig up the Muslim Matters article and look at the first initial definition of what spiritual abuse is, and, and just read it out, and then let's just discuss. Yeah, let me. Are there that any? Idea. Let me. Are there any Arab talking. or Persian tariqas that do not subject you to spiritual abuse? Seriously, hmm. uh, you know, by that by that definition. So, I mean, it matters if you're talking about, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm a little brown snowflake and, and he hurt my feelings because, uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, then, yeah, I guess he's guilty, um, guilty as charged. Uh, but uh, but what did they expect? I mean, this is not Sesame Street, uh, Sesame Street. Okay, right. I got so, it. Uh, so, Sister, yeah, I, go ahead. So it says, by the way, before giving a, a long introduction about um, what, you know, they're not attacking the Shadili Tariqa, they're just saying that this is blah, blah, blah. They go on to now speak about spiritual abuse in the title heads. What is spiritual abuse? And they go on to say, Spiritual abuse involves a repeated pattern of, oh, nice, an ad coming to me. Okay. A repeated pattern of coercion and controlling behavior in a religious context. One Muslim right. practitioner's definition of spiritual okay. abuse. Okay, just, uh, so, yeah. so let's just stop there at that definition. Okay. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the next definition is, is, is a lot more involved. Okay. But let's just stop at that definition. So because, co coercion uh, and controlling. Behavior. Right, coercion and controlling in a spiritual context. So that would be that would mean like, for example, making your murids go hungry. Uh, for example, um, uh, making them uh, uh, experience physical pain because they're standing up in prayer for hours. All things that Sufi sheikhs would do in the past. So, so Persian and uh, and Arab Sufism, by the de by this definition of a spiritual abuse, all tariqas are guilty. No, and, and sorry, if you can just enlighten us on that. You said something about standing up in prayer and being hungry, right? And I think that needs to be unpacked for people to understand actually why tariqahs did this and why people actually joined the tariqah in order to go through that. They did it willingly on their own, right? So Absolutely. Right? So they wanted to be a part because they knew that they need to uh, um, um, get rid of certain ailments that they believe. In which, what the which the hadith actually referred to is qillatul ta'am, lessening of your food, right? Standing Correct. up in prayer when everyone else is asleep. So that I think is something that's very much misunderstood. Number one of when they're referring to in what you're referring to as coercion, and you know, um, is because people actually willingly, grown adults, and sometimes they'll take their own children to these places or a part of a sheikh or his system in order to seclude themselves, whether temporarily or for, for a long period of time, away from the world, which is completely 
um, is completely absent of Allah. So you need to basically come back to your fitrah and you need to uh, lessen some resources that you're very heavily dependent on to depend on Allah, right? So I think that this is a very, very important point for people to understand before, like you mentioned, talking about coercion. What was the other word? Compulsion? Uh, coercion and controlling controlling behavior yeah. in a spiritual yeah and and in which oh, like and look 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 who they're actually attempting to to pander to when they're mentioning this right because people actually right. when they hear those words they think it's like borderline blasphemous or something mm -hmm. you know, you're doing to somebody mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but they don't realize right. this has always been the case but most of our conditioning right. I think this this definition extends to, I mean this could technically the way they're defining it could be applied to even just person who's a regular Muslim. Like, for example, exactly. an imam telling someone, hey, if you continue doing certain sins, this will take you to the hellfire, right? Is that not co right. is controlling or co coercion? Like saying they're trying to spiritually, I mean, use... Allah uses the idea of Jannah Nar to motivate people. Right. If the Sheikh does that, Correct. then what's the difference? That's what I'm saying. It's a very manipulative way of using yeah. words. Yeah, but anyways, continue, context. Mustafa. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Your thoughts on it. Uh, I was basically done. And so, I mean, read stories from Risal al uh where, you know, you have these murids just saying words like, Poot! just like they just need some food right and they are they're isolated and uh and and, and they will have cases of them you know uh because they were so distraught from not having food and not sleeping some of them would ru rub soil into their eyes until they went blind and then the sheikh would come and and rub over their eyes and make a dua these are all stories that exist in in uh in uh Risala Pushaidiyya and other such uh, books on Sufism. And so the idea of someone being a part of a, a, a Sufi tariqa and then complaining about spiritual abuse as per its this, this you know, standardized definition that's given at, uh, given at the start of the Muslim Matters article is really rather silly. I mean, it, you know, if you're not up for it, then just leave. There's, there's no big deal. Oh, but, you know, we will be perceived as non-Muslims. No, that's not true. You know, that's that's simply not true. I, I, I myself heard Sheikh Nuh saying in a public lesson in the Zawiyah that as for people who leave the tariqah, uh, they remain our brothers in Islam, but a murid, uh, uh, a murid's priorities are to uh, spend uh, spend time or keep the company of those who benefit them in their spiritual path. And so really, um, you know, crybaby snowflakes, is that too strong? Am yeah, I allowed to say that? that? Perfect. Well, a lot that's of why Sim loves you. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Some of, some of this stuff is um, gets amplified by people who were kind of uh, against Sufism and this whole um, people always kind of viewed the whole uh, Zawiyah, that neighborhood in Jordan with a little suspicion and uh, kind of give the, gave them some ammo and right. because they kind of uh, viewed it as a cult, right? I mean, let's just kind of put out there that the word was uh, you know the Sufi cults that are is is it I mean how do you respond to that that term is it is it a cult in uh, the Zawiya or or no some people treated it as a cult but maybe we could start with the definition of a cult yeah because uh, Islam can, Islam can you tell it, me what a cult is Islam in its origins could be a cult right some people do actually the haters of Islam call Islam a cult because mm -hmm. they say if you leave it there's like repercussions right or whatever it is right. And so they threaten right. repercussions. So they say that's one of the attributes of a cult. So technically, you can right. define any of these religions or anything similar to a cult. So the, the cult, well, the, the term I, cult. I think is in loose. being fair, in being fair, a a, 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 a Sufi tariqa, regardless, will always have a little bit more of a cult-like element because I think the key point is it um, uh, focusing on a personality. Right uh, on a mm. person, mm -hmm. and so in that sense, the the sheikh of a tariqa, you know. Are all Sufi Talifas cults? What? So I'm asking again. What is a cult? And I, I, once we I would, define that, yeah, how would I would, you I would say uh, because I gave it a lot of thought because I was thinking about uh, the differences between uh, why the major religions compared to something like Scientology or something, right? Um, and I thought that the cult mainly has a. Uh, they both share, you know, a very charismatic. Re religious type leader who's giving them a set of code and values to live by the only difference i would say is that the cult is a much more smaller subset of society it's mm -hmm. it's not as great in number as a religion or a major religion is um Do you the, the the cults um i think uh yeah i i think 
basically so what, what, what if i read out the yeah, definition you tell me if you guys agree yeah right um there's two okay. there's two definitions um a system of religious veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or object right or uh, a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister quote a network of satan worshiping cults end quote like so basically right. yeah just like i said a smaller subset mm -hmm. of society similar to a religion but it just hasn't been ad adopted widely the the reason why i think some people will call pl places like uh sheikh news neighborhood in jordan um a cult is because it's all um revolving around him even though he's right. part of the islamic family or the, or the muslim ummah and and etc but they're sheikh news the one who's defining all their actions and uh you know the, the the way they worship um how they worship and and uh you know gives them direction in, in in things related to their worldly life whether who should they who they should marry uh how many kids they should have uh, what kind of home they should buy this is not just sheikh Nu, by the way this is many other uh sufi t leaders who uh we, we have a couple like that in our chicago who are very you know venerated and they have uh they do a lot too i'm not, I'm not like dissing them i'm just saying that they they have uh, a a much larger presence in your personal life than us uh, for example a salafi sheikh or a tablighi sheikh or any etc right the, the the sufi sheikh that we're talking about and now we're not talking about all sufis but certain types of sufis who have uh, a much larger impact on your personal life than a regular sheikh would you know right so uh, some comments first of all i like sims um, definition of cult because it allowed me to say categorically that the community here is not a cult because he said it, it, it centers around a charismatic leader and Sheikh Nuh is, is highly introverted and highly intellectual and, 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 and rather dry so definitely not a charismatic leader so therefore you know based on Sims um, uh, definition of what a cult is no this is not a cult hmm. uh, based on the two definitions that uh, Morty mentioned the first one uh, does not apply uh, because uh, we don't venerate or or worship anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, even the actual tariqa of Abu Hassan al-Shadili, um, even though, uh, you know, the, the issue of tawassul um, is, a, is, is a fiqhi issue, but Abu Hassan al-Shadili, regardless of it being um, acceptable according to many fuqaha, didn't practice it because the Shabalis are that yun. They are people who are connect, or who are focused on the uh, the entity of Allah, and so they do not, as a general practice, uh, engage in uh, in tawassul. So, so no, there's not even you know it's it's veneration of Allah subhanahu wa taala and worship of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, the second definition was a small group. Uh, uh, could, could you repeat that again? A small yeah, group? relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. That may apply, you know. In all honesty, that may apply to uh, to uh, various different uh, Sufi tariqas, including our own. I mean, there uh, there are some beliefs um, uh, that uh, some people may consider strange, uh, primarily uh, because of just how little islamic knowledge there is um or practices like the the sufi habra which is permitted in the shafi school i mean uh, if you want i can quote imam nawawi's uh minhaj um that indicates that dancing is permissible and so dancing as a permissible act when combined with something other something else permissible such as dhikr or uh which is actually an act of worship uh or for example devotional singing does not become haram so, but these practices, people find odd, find, you know, alienating. Um, so maybe under that definition, if we want to just apply the definition blindly, maybe we are a cult and I'm okay so, with that. So I, I, think, I think what happens though is that, see, so, so there are, I think people understand that, um, I, I think people who are against, I have a different position, they lump all uh, groups of, of uh, Sophia together. Right. Like, for example, right. I've had my experiences, right? Like I've been around with people like um, the uh, Haqqani, you know, the Naqshbandi. And to me, without a shadow right. of a doubt, they're a cult. 
I mean, I've been embedded okay. with them. Uh, I, I stayed in their farm. I mean, to me, they're a cult hundred percent. Like the the type of thing okay. they would do, um, the type of the type of even like just the idea of even having to, uh, you know, <laughs> like it's it just. I, I mean, I don't want to get into details when I make the show about that right now, but um, certainly the practices by this definition would be a cult, meaning that you know that it, it, right. it certainly has strange practices that you would find. Forget about even just the Hedra. I'm talking about other things that are outside of that that you would know that are not even traditionally what the traditional Tasawuf was about, right? They've incorporated right. some of those. And I think people take those examples and then lump them with everybody and say, well, they all must have the same belief, right? And whether right. or not I, I'm part of it or agree with it or not is something different, but to be accurate, they don't all have the same beliefs, and I don't think we can lump them all together. And that's dangerous because Absolutely. we don't want people to be lumped together. Absolutely. And but you know what? I, I think that a lot of this is, from my perspective, a red herring, because the people that I have an issue with are the people who wrote these articles who are deracinated Sufis. And so I, I'm not concerned with those who hate Sufism mm. uh, so much. I mean, I, I'm concerned with those who uh, saw what they saw or saw what they claimed to have seen, experienced what they have uh, 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 claimed to have uh, uh, experienced, failed their families, failed their children, and then went off like a bunch of snotty little crybabies and, and wrote this long article. That should be illegal. If I something agree. is a crime, if yes. something is a crime, Either take it to the courts or shut up. But claiming, but doing, but doing cancel culture. I mean, just imagine that there is like, imagine that there's an imam of a mosque that you know that's really pious, and then people just start claiming that he uh, rapes women. Or, or uh, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but imagine trying to clear his name after those allegations. Agreed. Yeah. How on Agreed. earth would you would you clear his name? Yeah, right. So, so and this is why we have the punishment for Quds in Islam. Uh, I'm not suggesting that, that this is an extension. <laughs> Uh, of cuz i'm just saying that you know if you don't have proof if you have proof take it to the courts because they're they are the ones that are capable of dealing with it if you don't have proof then shut up right so how much of this do you th and i love that point because we can we're not here to talk about whether sufism is right or wrong this isn't the issue the issue is that regardless of whether the, someone's right or wrong in their beliefs is it permissible to slander somebody publicly without evidence or is it appropriate to do so without first going to authorities right and i think we can all agree here for the most part that no we don't believe in that however i believe personally mustafa that there's a narrative now coming especially from the western world that especially with the push of liberalism that you have to believe all these allegations especially from one gender to the other right there should be no question right. if you question this you are a scumbag yeah. Because you, how dare you, 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 you how, why would someone make that up? And I think, yeah. I, I want to know from your perspective, mm. how much of this cancel culture uh, do you think would influence what they just did right now? Because it seems to me that this is a, a, a textbook, you know, a case of, of, of you know, cancel culture. Yeah. I, I believe that the, there were certain, uh, uh, there were certain actions that were done uh, not by Sheikh Nuh himself, but by others, uh, that were not acceptable. Um, but uh, was there a cancel culture? I think that they they themselves had submitted to, and I, I really, if, if anything comes out of this talk, what I'd like people to do is to find the YouTube video on uh, where uh, that discusses Bonhoeffer's theory of stupidity, right? Um, <laughs> and how stupid and how stupidity is an immoral choice. So they chose to adopt a um, a uh, a cult mentality that made them feel that they would be dirty, that they would be bad, that they would be essentially, you know, like me, um, <laughs> if they complained. Um, uh, and uh, and then when they couldn't handle it anymore, they just blew up. You know, just yeah. well, be the guy that goes but, in and flips people off. Yeah, and don't and be the guy that goes in and shoots people. One of the things that just surprised me was that, you know, as a, as a parent, you know, when, if someone is hitting your, your child, it's this, well, you know, especially when you're, you're trying to get your child to be interested in Islam and the faith and you're, you're trying to get, get them, uh, you know, excited about it. And uh, as a parent, I would be like, you know what, this is not my, my thing. This is maybe some other parents uh, want their kids to be uh, 
you know, they want they want their kids they're to be okay educated. With that. They're okay right. with mm -hmm. that the type of education. Dojo but, setup, yeah. but yeah, I there's no way I I would want my kids because I've been through that when I was younger, and I was like, you know, it made me want to not be part, you know, so close to the religion at least when I was young. So I I am really averse to that, and the the moment that happens, I would be like, you know what. Uh, um, honey, we made a mistake coming to this country, and uh, I think we should go back. You know, <laughs> or maybe right. we find a different oh, teacher. Oh, say can you? See? <laughs> I mean, why would you? Why would you just for how many years? So were you part of this? And then you're like, oh well, we tried to bring it up, and no yeah, one listened to us. Part. Like, like I mean, if you see your child getting abused, right? I don't care. I mean, look, if you if you claim it's abuse, right? Let's yeah. just be it's a lot of abuse. If you feel, that was, yeah, if you feel abuse. that was abuse, right? Yeah. The first thing anybody would do, a smart and intelligent person, a critical thinker would say, wait a minute, this is not for me. Maybe it's a culture here, maybe they agree. I don't have to even condemn the culture, but it's not my culture. It's not for me, so I'm gonna pull out, right? Yeah. You don't, I mean, right. if you go to a place where you know it's set up already, right, you don't go try to always just change the whole damn thing, right? Like, you, that's just, right. it's already established. You don't like the, like, for example, if I go to, people go to places in, 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 the, in the Middle Eastern world, and they want to make hijrah, they don't like the way things are, they come back. They don't try to change the whole society, right? It's just not the way well, it is. Yeah. One of the funny things it, is it's like, it's, it's like going to a Daisy restaurant and complaining that the food's spicy. I mean, like, <laughs> the, 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 the rules, the rules for how the, the community run, is run in Kharabsha are all public. Like you people have, you, you all read, you all understood that Sheikh Nur says, look, these are the rules that we live by. Uh, now, another thing is that uh, I tend to be a little bit weird. Um, no. I, I, I have fond, I, I have fond memories of getting hit by my by my my Daisy schoolmaster, and Daisies are like really beloved to me, and that's just part of me growing up. It's like yeah, you know the, the master. I, I won't mention what, what his name was, but he was like he started the the Muslim school in Vancouver, and like he's he's like one of my role models, and a lot of people are like. You know, uh, you know, the, he used to beat the kids. I was like, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> and so as long as it doesn't go outside the bounds of the Sharia, I'm OK. With it. I couldn't um, agree more. I mean, I, I'm, ju I'm just like you, to be honest. I think when I was younger, um, I, I do think those little spankings, those things, they help character build. Right. And it's just, yeah. um, I've, I'm not saying that abuse should be tolerated like you. Uh, I mean, there's certain case people who definitely who go above and beyond and should not be allowed. Of course, uh, right. But, um, I mean, this has just been a tradition for centuries you know 12, we, 12 right. of the 50 states still have corporal punishment in in, 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 a, in the united states yeah, yeah. That's that's they're part so, of right. so one i'm not saying they do it but it's part of the no yeah right. it's legal and so I I, I, i'm it. not i'm not defending anything that goes beyond the shit yeah. sure same here so Just one, one observation yeah. that i had uh mustafa is actually there's two things i was actually willing i wanted to ask you this in the beginning by saying that look madrasas have 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 had the system all along and parents willingly send their kids to madrasas and parents who know that there is physical conditioning in madrasas they just won't send them to that madrasa and they know that everybody knows that right but Correct. one one thing that i understood from the articles and what people generally say about karabcha and sheikh Nur is that people have complained about things that were originally not allowed by teachers and nothing was actually being done about it right so that's one of the claims okay. is the claim is that it wasn't ever allowed to physically condition children i don't know if that was true or not that's why i think we have okay. you here and the second part is that even though it wasn't allowed these complaints were taken up to the top and nothing was done by it that's why we're publishing this article well uh, the the two the the couple that was running the school were asked to leave the height Mm. And they were, and the school was dissolved, and so th that's what I know. Cool. All right. So, so my my understanding is that this was actually not technically a school, right? I mean, it was referred to as one, but it was not officially registered. That's as why a school. I called the cops on them. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so was it? So it was. So they were operating as one, but they were not officially a school, and so that violated. Uh, they were not bound by, by by regulation, I guess, in that sense. Correct. Okay. Nice. So that could lead to problems with things written down. But I, but my, my, my biggest thing, though, is that I think they had to know 
I mean, is there like a handbook you get when you move in here, like you know, homeowners association, where hey, you can't do this and you can't do that? I'm sure they must have signed something or been like, or agreed to at least verbally. No, but like, that's what I think. That's what he's saying. That's kind I mean, of. Are you kidding me? There's like these drones that have like their their, their proms are programmed. So if you ever violate, they, they, they just pays you, right? <laughs> just they had nine. to stop that. They had to stop that because I told them like from the, the electrotherapy, I got so used to it while I was institutionalized <laughs> that I started enjoying it. So Enjoy. it just stopped pacing me. So I, I'm being sarcastic. So, so yes, there is a there is a handbook called as a rule, and and it, everything's written in there. Um, oh wow! So and it's 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 published. You can Google this. Yeah. So do they get this as like a welcome package if they're playing on perspective like movers who are moving over there or wanting to join? Do they do, do, do they do they have this information beforehand and and then they look through it? I mean, it's it, it, it or how how does that work? Uh, generally uh, i mean uh, g i mean i moved here in 2006 so it was quite a, a while ago but uh, there was there was always the understanding that there were certain rules of the high that you lived by mm -hmm. and there was always the understanding if you had you know uh, uh, an active brain that 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 this was a part of jordan and so nothing yeah. was binding other than jordanian law correct mm -hmm. yeah and and and, and apology has to think this too because I'm thinking about this as a parent or rationally at least thinking as a thinking human being, you're probably moving to this place from another. And, and, and before I say that, I'm going to say probably majority of the people that are complaining about this probably never really lived in the Middle East or understood mm. that culture in the first place. They have a different cultural yes. understanding. But that being said, I have a feeling, I have a hunch that many of them wanted to move to be in a more "quote unquote" Islamic environment in the first of place. Of course, they did. Right? Correct. So, what do you expect? <laughs> like, I mean, what what do you, what do you think yeah. that everything was going to be the same as it was from the place that you left? No, but like, look at the audience that they're addressing, and in, in the, in they're they're talking to right. the Western English speaking audience that finds these things very corrosive and very. If, if imagine if this Middle East I whatever was published in it. Or Muslim matters were published in the Middle East. No one cares. Tell them Somalia and the Dixon. Oh, you, you know, th this is this is actually hilarious because you just reminded me of something. So in in British Columbia, um, there was a uh, there was a, a sheikh who uh, you know attracted the attention of uh, of the authorities because he made some unsavory statements about our uh, uh, our cousins, uh, the the, the oh. Jewish nation. <laughs> uh, and when I when I first came to Jordan, they said, okay, you're Canadian and you're from the same. Uh, province has him so tell us tell us about him and so i'm not going to snitch him out i'm just going to say what was public what was what was mentioned on the front page of newspapers right so that way uh, i don't look like i'm withholding information anyhow I, I i don't know the guy personally i don't look like i'm withholding information and at the same time uh, i'm not snitching him out because it was on the on the front page of newspapers i said well you know he said that they were the uh, descendants of pigs and uh, uh, of of uh, uh, of, uh, of pigs and apes and the Mukhabarat were there waiting like, okay, when does the juicy part come? You know, they're, they're just waiting for what's next. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so their understanding, uh, like they were so, uh, so uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not defending that at all. I'm saying that, uh, that the, the understanding here uh, can, and the cultural, uh, the cultural reflection uh, or, or cultural values can be quite different than they are in the West. Yeah. I mean, so, so so uh, basically, um, you you were someone who had moved on to uh, you migrated from Canada, right? And uh, can you walk us through your process? Because many brothers nowadays are discussing leaving the West and, and coming to a different country. And uh, explain to us your experience, your thought process, your challenges uh, around that, and and how you overcame some of that. Right. It, uh, I should write some epic saga one day on, on this issue. So it, it, uh, so basically, for, for the longest time, I wanted to move to a Muslim country and preferably an Arab country, uh, but not limited to Arab countries. I applied to Brunei and Malaysia and what have you, and, oh, wow. uh, and uh, as well as Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Um, Saudi Arabia, I turned down. Egypt, I turned down. Uh, Egypt because of money. Saudi Arabia for other reasons. Um, and what happened is in... Uh, I had this job in Vancouver that was so awesome that I thought to myself, what am I nuts? Would I leave this job? I mean, it was like the, it was a startup that was, uh, that was budding and it was, uh, and I was a team lead and we we're developing this new product and it was, it was great. Um, I thought, you know, I'd have to be nuts to want to leave 
uh, this job. Um, and then what happened is they fired my boss and put this uh, drunk dude uh, <laughs> in his place. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, my, my whole attitude towards work sp- uh, changed. And I went to Hedge in, uh, I think it was December slash January. Um, it, yeah, so it was December 2004, January 2005. I think that was Hedge time uh, 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 during those years. And I supplicated for two major things. The first was I had a lot of problems with my wife at the time. And my, so I was praying that Allah would fix things between uh, my wife and me. And the other was I was really worried sick about raising my children in Canada. Um, like really to the point of where I felt like I was going to have an anxiety attack. How are they going to turn out in Canada? Mm. And so my whole hedge was focused on praying uh, about those two issues. I returned to Vancouver after Hedge, and uh, I got a call shortly afterwards uh, from uh, some people in uh, in Hail Harabsha in Amman, and they said, you know, we need an IT manager um, uh, in uh, in Harabsha for this particular company. Would you be interested in uh, in taking the job? Uh, starting, you know, we'll give you plenty of time. Starting in two, uh, this uh, two thousand six, so you have a full year. I said, you know, let me pray istikhara, pray istikhara, uh, and uh, and uh, the uh, the owner of the company said, you know, uh, is your wife okay with it? Uh, and it turns out that Sheikh Nuh told him to ask me that. Uh, so, long story short, on the day of travel, my wife at the time said, I'm not going with you. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and so, you know how you, wow. you know how sometimes you have to re- reboot your computer into safe mode, yeah. um, and then there's like limited functionality, right? <laughs> and so I was like, okay, safe mode. What on earth am I gonna do? I have three kids. I sold everything. Um, I oh. quit my job. I'm going to uh, a new uh, country. Although my youngest daughter at the time thought I was going to a new planet, which. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it isn't that far off. Um, uh, I'm going to a completely new country. What's going to happen? So I said, okay, okay, panic mode. First thing, we're going to go to a um, uh, to uh, to a lawyer, or uh, and we're going to have my wife write and sign that she approves of me taking the kids to Jordan one way, not returning. You know, so that I don't end up with a with an abduction case. Uh, you know, facing ad- that I abducted my kids or whatever. Um, uh, it's funny how only men can be accused of abducting their kids. Right. Uh, so in any case, uh, so uh, and and she did because I mean she knew that there was no getting rid of me unless I had the kids, right? And uh, and so I went to the uh, I went to the uh, uh, the uh, the airport uh, and I bought my kids a bunch of. Uh, toys and activities, way overpriced. But I was like, if the kids start talking to me about their mother on the plane, I'm going to start bawling. And I don't want to do that, right? So I am go- so I just got them as many activities as I could so that uh, I could keep them, you know, basically drug them with toys and, 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 fu- and fun so that they, they wouldn't ask me about what was going on. <laughs> um, finally arrived in Jordan and put them, yeah, when I arrived in the airport, uh, I really appreciate this guy that, that picked me up. Um, he told him uh, he, he was told that there was a, a party of five, right? And so he sees that there's four of us. And so he said, "Is that all of you?" And I said, "Yes." And he didn't ask a further question. He later told me he said he looked pretty stressed out. So wait, I wait, that I how was questions. she okay with you taking the kids just permanently to another country? Did, did she know you were going permanently? Did Absolutely. She, maybe did she think that this is just an adventure that uh, Mustafa has in his mind and no, be back in no, a she more? wanted to get rid of me for a long time. And you oh. wanted to get rid of me for no, it's just so yeah, surprising. So. I mean, I don't want to get into your personal stuff. Yeah, jeez, you might but, not want to talk about no, this. but but many like yeah, just put them on a spot. M- m- mothers don't usually want to give up their kids like well, some do, some do. Uh, she wanted to get rid of me, so uh, okay. that was the method. Uh, and uh, and I mean, uh, alhamdulillah, yeah. she, she's not worked out. <laughs> yeah, but uh, she's, I, I she's think a decent human being. I'm not. Uh, she's a decent human being. I mean, especially when I hear about other divorce stories, uh, she she wasn't uh, malicious. Um, how should I say? Uh, she wasn't malicious or anything. Mm, it's just, okay. yeah. uh, so, so what what seeded our problems, and this is pro- possibly an issue that I'd like to talk about more uh, because it's more interesting, is that I had actually practiced polygamy in Canada. So I, she was my number one. I oh. married number two. Uh, marriage number two didn't really work out the that well. Thickens. Divorce, divorce number two. But number one never got over it. 
it, mm. right? She never got over it. Uh, and, you know, I was younger uh, and stupider at the time. And so, I mean, I blame myself. I practiced it in a totally, you know, asinine manner. Uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a right and a wrong way to do uh, polygamy. And I think that in Canada, it was like the textbook wrong way and in uh, in uh, uh in uh, uh jordan book coming soon uh it's the textbook <laughs> right way uh of doing it so right? so that, that so, kind of answers my next question so you uh, so 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 you uh, you actually ended up doing polygamy again then right and but the right way absolutely yeah absolutely so so let me ask you this <laughs> uh a lot of brothers out there will tell you that oh it's too much one woman's too much can't deal with it um what would you what would you would you ever tell brothers not to do polygamy in, in some way because there are people who everyone yeah everyone who has ever asked my advice on polygamy has not gone through with it and that's a good point because i think a lot of people talk about it but there's a lot of talkers and never doers so there's people who right. will talk about it and usually here's my problem with this see i'm a big fan of polygamy i think polygamy is great However, if you're going into polygamy because you have an issue with your first wife, mm. right? That's not the right that's, reason that, to go into absolutely. That's that's the wrong polygamy, yeah. right? And I think that's why they even entertain, entertain the conversation because they're like, "Oh snap, I have a problem with my wife. What if I get just a second wife?" And, you know, and then just kind of fix the problem, right? But I, but I want to know no. what your questions are when somebody comes to you and says that uh, you know I want to marry a, another wife. What's your series of questions? What what's the check? What's the checklist you ask them? Buy my book, uh, but okay. So seriously, I, I haven't written my book yet, uh, and actually, I'm 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 writing a, a, a I've written a large portion of a didactic poem, and the book will be uh, a mandoma uh, or juza, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the book will basically be a sharh of that. But th there's a number of questions. So first of all, in general, if you want to practice polygamy, then go into the first marriage telling your wife. Mm -hmm. I want to practice polygamy. And if you can't do that, then, you know, as a gentleman, at the very least, uh, get your first wife's approval. Uh, yeah. But if you've told her at the start, then, uh, then, uh, then it shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of young men, a lot of young men say, you know, that's easy for you to say because you're older and more experienced and more confident. Mm -hmm. And it's true. However, there, there's, there's always a silver lining. OK, the silver lining is with divorce rates as they are, you will get a second chance. Right. <laughs> so, so most people will get a second chance. I'm sorry to say it that way. But really, so so if, if it's going to kill your wife, like emotionally and psychologically to go marry another woman, then don't do it. Don't be don't be a jerk. Don't be an ass. Don't do it. Um, and either divorce her or uh, or, you know, uh, have patience with her and. And if things don't work out, then when you go into your uh, your after uh, your uh, your next marriage, then mention it up front. Yeah, hey, women uh, generally. Uh, but uh, I have a question for you. Sorry, mm -hmm. this is psych. Because this has always been very curious to me. What is that conversation like with the second <laughs> wife, Wally? Like, hey, by the way, I'm married. Well, you know, I'm already married. Because a lot of guys, you know, a lot of fathers. Like we talked about this in the last episode, and. You know, unconsciously, like Sim had verbalized that, hey, it's like a, it's like a second great thing to be a second wife, right? Like he just didn't mean to put it down, but it just came out. Like I wouldn't advise my daughter was was you know well accomplished. I wouldn't advise her to be a second wife. But I'm saying what, there are fathers who who hold their daughters in high esteem like this. Like it's just natural, just love. But how do you talk to like? Uh, I mean, like, how, do, do you come out right yeah. away and tell that 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 prospective uh, second wife's uh, wedding or father that uh, hey, I'm already married? And and usually, like, what was that reaction like? What was what was the like the 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 challenges there? Yeah. Well, he he asked. Uh, so I mean, typically uh, the way it works in Arab society is you're connected through someone, right? So uh, so for example, uh, my uh, second wife's father is the imam of a mosque mm. right so so uh, and so i would i was going through the imam of uh of my uh my neighborhood mosque uh to find people so so there's there's always a connection and because there's that connection before you even reach them they know that so that's really right. interesting because I think a lot of guys in this country are trying to do it their own way. Like they're trying mm -hmm. to just jump on an app maybe and then be like swipe, swipe, swipe and then kind of talk to the girl and then see, oh, okay, maybe I'm testing the waters. It might work through and then sometimes it does and they don't really have, because you know, unfortunately there's a lot more autonomy 
in the Western world in terms of how you get married, right? It's just way different than back right. home, right? Like you're kind of forced right. to do it for yourself or, fi or maybe through university or colleges or MSA or all my group pick of love classes, but <laughs> nonetheless, but you right. would do that, right? So maybe that's why it was easier for you. But I think that for other guys, like, you know, I think that conversation of having after just met a woman on maybe some app or whatever, then having to now approach the father already and say, hey, uh, I'm I'm married, by the way, but uh, I'm looking for a second wife. Like, I'm, I couldn't imagine that conversation. Well, I, I actually did have a membership on Muslima.com for a while, mm. and uh, and I just put it in my title, like looking for second wife. They didn't ban you, and uh, of course not. <laughs> why, why would they ban me? Because it's so my second, Okay, it, it's after, misogynistic. After I ban my, after I married my second wife. Um, I, I, I just figured I'm going to try something interesting. So there was this woman that had this profile name that was like, uh, no, uh, no one who wants a second wife. So I like immediately <laughs> write to her and I'm saying, I said, I'm looking for a third wife. Is that okay? <laughs> now, now, would you ever advise your daughter now to put in context what Mort was saying? For example, my daughter, I wouldn't recommend her to be a second wife to anyone because especially as her first marriage you know now if you are um you know divorced or, or you know have uh, other conditions after your first marriage that um you end up finding a good caretaker um who can take care of you and possibly a, a child or so um then then uh, that could possibly be something i would recommend but as a first uh, marriage of your daughter do you have any daughters? Or would you ever advise if you I did? I have two daughters. I have three daughters, two who are married. Are they? Are any of them second wives? No. Would, but, you, would you ever recommend that it, to them or stop uh, them? I, I, that's not my business. I ask them what they want, and I communicate that with the uh, to the uh, to the prospect uh, to the uh, prospective groom. Why would I make that decision for them? They're the ones that make that decision. Right. 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 So. So. I, I mean. I. Uh, I. I. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, my uh, when my second daughter was getting married, I asked her, "Look, this guy, Alhamdulillah, he has money. And when men have money, they uh, uh, they uh, they have for second wives." <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Is that something that you're okay with? And she said, "No." So I told the guy, "Look, it's halal, completely halal, and it's your right to have as many wives as as you want, uh, uh, you know, within the bounds of the Sharia." Uh, but my my daughter isn't interested in that so if that's something you want to pursue then that's your right but pursue it elsewhere and he said no that's not something i want to pursue that it's that simple yeah. you know stupidity is a choice <laughs> there, there are so many easy solutions and and I, just something that i want to emphasize uh is that we should never uh make polygamy whether uh, you know we should never make the first or the second or any subsequent wife feel that she's inferior because of polygamy and uh when my uh second uh when my second father-in-law asked me why do you want a second wife i said mm. not because of any uh uh shortcoming or or or, or limitation uh, on her behalf, but because of an excess on my behalf. And you can interpret that however you want. But the point is, chivalry entails not making women feel, you know, inferior, that there's something wrong with them. And so therefore, you know, you have to go out and have a, a second wife uh, and, and shouldn't make that, you know, the second wife feel that, you know, you know, you're, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of a mutant and you're old and you're ugly. So therefore it's okay if you're a second wife. Right. And, and, <laughs> you know and, what I mean? <laughs> and that was my point. Like, 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 I, for, first of all, I fully understand the right of a woman to say she doesn't want to be in a polygamous marriage, especially if she's getting married for the first time, that's within her expectations. Okay. Right. And, a right. father can also advise his daughter too. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not against of that. Of course, yes. Meaning that you, if a father knows her personality, knows what we you know. If she's a really jealous type, what she can Absolutely. handle. So a father can make advice to his daughter and say, "I don't think that this would be good for you." Right. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. Right. My problem is that it's always looked at as something as second rate. Like, oh, you don't deserve that. You deserve better than that. And it's not about deserving. Right. Right, because the greatest men of this ummah had multiple wives, and their greatest women right. were co-wives. Right, so if we right. look at that and say, wait a minute, you know, if 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 we apply that standard, I'm okay. I mean, if you're just trying to protect right. and by the by understanding the nature of somebody, like I know there's certain men that I know that you're not capable of having a second wife. Oh, like yeah. you're just not yeah. right. right, and you shouldn't do it. 
right? No, right. you're not one of them. You're, you're actually, no. But anyways, but, Jeff, no, you, but you are definitely one yeah, of them. Yeah, you're a quality man. You should have more than one wife. But anyways, listen. Um, <laughs> no, but I mean, shit, that's my dude. point, uh, Mustafa. That, that I, I have no problem with someone advising someone saying, hey, you're not made for this or maybe you have some difficulties in it or, you know, can, can you know, uh, adapting to it. But to make it seem like it's bad. And the reason why I say that is because in the Middle East, I know of stories where there will be women who are okay with their husbands cheating on them. Rather than yeah. having a second wife because they're worried about what culture will say about them being second rate exactly. or not satisfying enough. Yeah. And that's that's so sad. Yeah. You're okay with your husband your husband making dinner. Yeah. Then yeah. rather knowing the yeah. woman and having a that's halal hideous. relationship. What a horrible mindset right. to be in in the Yeah. It's it's sad. It's sad. Wow. Now um Mustafa, you you were as as you moved into Jordan, you got into or maybe you started this in Canada. Maybe I don't know the timeline. But when did you start getting into uh, poetry and uh, translation? Talk to us a little bit about the work that you started doing um, in your time in Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I, I started writing poetry when I was in grade four in Canada. If, you're, if we're talking wow. about English poetry. Um, now, back when I was in high school, um, I remember reading Arabic poetry and... Uh, I actually mentioned to uh, uh, a, a friend of mine in high school, I said, you know what, I really want to master Arabic one day, like at, at the true level of mastery, but there's one thing that I'll never be able to do, and that is poetry, because it was, it's just too weird, it's just too different. That's uh, and yeah, and so I told him that, that that's that's the one thing that I'll never be able to do. And then one day, uh, you know, I, I tried a couple times to learn uh uh, the, the meter of Arabic poetry. I've always liked reading it. Um, and then uh, one day, uh, a brother told me, you know what, there's actually a, uh, there's actually this, uh, this article in the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Arabic Literature on prosody. And they, they summarize it in, 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 in four pages. Mm. And so he gave me the article and I started reading the article. And then for like four days straight, because it was quite packed, um, for four days straight, I was reading and rereading and rereading the article. Like every every uh, spare hour that I had my during my breaks, during you know, uh, like my wife would have to call me to dinner several times, and I would you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, I, I just kept reading it and reading it and reading it, and I was like, it was a eureka moment. It was like, there, you know. The, if I just explain this to the world, they will realize, they will realize how easy it is to write Arabic poetry. And I really thought that, that people would care. Uh, <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 In my I, head. I, I, I was, I, you know, I, I thought, I thought if I just write this out in Arabic, so I wrote it as a metan. Right as a as a, a, a okay. so I wrote it as an Arabic metan, um, using the uh, you know the this uh, traditional terminology. Uh, but uh, because the thing is that um, prosody is the one Arabic discipline that was developed by Arabs, and so mm. it is very hard to follow in the traditional methodology. Right? They, you look at grammar. There's the Kufan school, which was pred, uh, uh, dominantly Arabic, and there's the Basran school, which is dominantly Persian. The Kufan school died out, and and the, uh, and because why? Because the Persians had a madrasa system. I mean, it wasn't called a madrasa system, but they basically had uh, an academic system. So, and also the Persians had this advantage of looking at Arabic from the outside, right? And so their model of Arabic grammar was amazing. Um, and Farahidi, uh, rahimahullah, is the one who invented Arabic grammar. And it's like, you know, it's so easy. This is, this is, we're going to call this, uh, you know, the name of a camel's short, uh, shortened, uh, shortened tail, or it's, uh, or it's, uh, you know, uh, disheveled hair. Uh, we're going to name this after, uh, after a, uh, after a, uh, after a, uh, uh, something in the desert or, or, or pegs in, and tents and, and camels and horses. And like, it's just so obvious and so easy. And it uses multisyllabic forms. It's impossible, or it's, it's, I shouldn't say it's impossible. Arabic uh, prosody, according to the traditional Arabic methodology, is just ridiculously difficult, right? According to the Orientalist uh, method, which is based on syllables as to uh, as opposed to multi, uh, polysyllabic, you know, groupings of uh, or polysyllabic uh, uh, groups, um, is very very simple. It's just basically a mold. It's 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 based on uh, on syllable length, not syllable strength, and it's incredibly mechanical. 
And I was like, I can't believe it. I'm going to write this as a metan. And when I write this as a metan, I am sure the world will come to me, you know, uh, and, 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 and will just be in, and they're, they're you know, the, those, those, those memes where the guy's brain just like, or those gifs where the, where the guy's brain just, just blows up. <laughs> and it was like, I can't believe it's that easy. And, and I, I, I was going around to people and they're like, okay. Uh, and, and that was just their response. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and it wasn't, they, they weren't terribly excited. So I was 39 when I learned how to write, uh, uh, when I learned basically the, uh, 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 Arabic prosody. Um, I realize that I look 16 now, but I was 39 at the time when I uh, when I learned to write Arabic poetry. And uh, and Alhamdulillah, I uh, I uh, uh, participated in a poetry competition and got a prize. Shahar so, million, huh? I mean, no, but thing uh, is... no, 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 not <laughs> Shahar, not, not Shahar million. No, you know, but I mean, so I, I I find it fascinating to be honest. I mean, I. I I'm not, I'm nowhere near a level of Arabic where I could even begin to write poetry, but uh, I do find it. Um, I mean, I, 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 it's beautiful to me. Uh, I mean, do you listen to? I mean, do you read like modern poets like Nazar Kabbani or, or more contemporary, or do you just? I see what you do there. I see what you do there, Nazar Kabbani. Yeah. So so uh, Nizar Kabbani has certainly has some uh, some great poems uh but it's uh, it's unfortunate that you know some of his poems are like my facebook posts it's like <laughs> dude, what were you saying uh, you, you know it's like rambling uh, so, so, so some of them are just dribble you know what i mean it's yeah. like uh, you know he's, he's just uh, he's just uh you know uh throwing himself at women's feet and um and uh, not that i do that in my facebook posts but uh, i mean but but let's not forget that ahmed shawqi is technically a modern poet i mean he yes. died in 1932 yes right uh al jawahiri the iraqi was also a uh, contemporary poet Tam tamim al barghuthi has some poetry that's you know pretty darn good Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are modern poets. So not everything has to be, you know, not everything modern is free verse um, and yeah. uh, and uh, and such. But you primarily mm -hmm. probably like the more classical stuff, right? The older rather than more contemporary. Uh, I I like to mean uh, I mean Situna Aman is is a really great poem. Uh, the uh, Nasr al Farana and his poem on Ooh. Muluk al Jinn. I mean that is over the top. I remember I mean, hearing Nasr guy... Farana like years ago on YouTube in a, in a yeah. poetry competition, and this guy, honestly, his wordplay is amazing. Like this, just this. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you if you think that you know. Uh, if you think, oh wow, this guy has two wives, not sort of Quran and, and poetry isn't reality, but he's like, I married, I married fifteen jinni women. You know, I mean, like, the guy is over the top. Bro, this is one of the coolest books awesome. you ever bought, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, knew, I knew you guys would love him, bro. Man, mashallah, I wish we met you before, bro. This is like the most entertaining Saturday morning I ever had in my life, dude. Some, some of our uh, some of our listeners are saying that uh, we went through the Hijra topic a little too quickly. So uh, talk us through a little bit about why you would recommend uh, other people or other people living in the West uh, to move uh, abroad. Uh, walk us through a little bit about why you chose uh, Urdun, as uh, they say, right? Yeah. Not Hurdun, like the Mexicans yeah. say. No, no, no. The Mexicans say Hurdun, right? No, yeah, it's Hurdun. No, it's Hurdun. No, no, the Mexicans. No, no, no. Hordania, Hordania. Hordania? Hordania oh. in Spanish. Oh, in Spanish, yeah. yeah Hordania, yeah. Okay. Na Hordun. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, I didn't really choose Jordan. Jordan chose me. So, I got a job oh. offer here that made, that made sense, right? But then, uh, you know, uh, then I got married here. Uh, and then got married again. And actually, I have a daughter who's buried here, alhamdulillah. And so Jordan became my home. Um, and so uh, so I didn't really choose Jordan, but now I do choose Jordan, alhamdulillah. Uh, so why would, why did I move here? And, you know, what are some signs that maybe you should move here or, or move, you know, or leave, uh, you know, um, places like America and Canada? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, it's it, my 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 eldest son. Uh, alhamdulillah, he's uh, alhamdulillah a religious uh, uh, young man. Uh, alhamdulillah, may Allah preserve him and all of our children. Um, uh, but when he was going through high school, when he was with Jordanian kids, um, they were convincing him uh, that your father must be a special kind of stupid uh, to take you from Canada. <laughs> you know. 
and bring you here. And it's like, once I was reading, uh, so just as a digression, uh, once I was reading a news, or uh, flipping through a newspaper, and it's like, uh, you know, I flip through the newspaper, and then there's this page like, speak English fluently. So I flip the page, next page, there's another ad, immigrate to Canada. Next page, you know, mm. uh, graduate, graduate from a Western university. So I told my wife, you know what? I kind of feel like I was in paradise. And then I, I came down to hell. Like, it's like you guys think that, you know, that everything I have is, is, is what you guys want. Um, so in any case, my son had this mindset while he was in high school um, and while he was in university, uh, but not when he left university, because it's horrifically expensive here. Um, he then continued his studies in Canada. He's in Canada now. Um, so when he was among Jordan, uh, 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 Jordanian youth, he had this poisoned mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that you know no one would choose jordan over canada and i i face this on you know at least a weekly basis if not you know mm -hmm. uh, multiple times per week where people are like why would you leave canada like why did you leave paradise and come to live with us in hell right. uh, and so in any case um he was telling me uh he, he was uh so i said okay i have a question for you who says that canada is better than jordan uh, or sorry i said who says that jordan is better than canada mm. okay who says jordan is better than canada mm -hmm. he said you and mama because even though his uh, his mother and i weren't married she mm -hmm. was still on the same page uh, you know she's she's a, a good woman alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah so he said you and mama and your group like meaning you know the, the backward stupid people uh, mm -hmm. the, you know uh, uh, he didn't say that he's respectful but he said you and mama and your group i said okay cool who says that Canada is better than Jordan? He said, everyone else. I said, you know what? You just convinced me that my decision to bring you here was right. And he said, how? I said, if we were in Canada right now, if we were living in Canada right now, the conversation would have been uh, like this. Who says that homosexuality is sinful? And you would have said, you and mama and group of people at the, at the, at the mosque. And if I asked you who said that, who says that homosexuality is natural, you would have said everyone else. Allah. And Allah. so you know what? And so I told him, you know what, son, hate Jordan. It's okay. You can hate Jordan. Loving Jordan is is not an article of iman. So mm. go ahead and hate Jordan. Alhamdulillah that you didn't grow up loving homo uh, or or accepting homosexuality. <laughs> yeah. He said, well, you you, you know, but th that happens here too. I said that it happens here too, but people are ashamed. Sure. They, they don't go on parades uh, uh, and, and say, you know, gay pride and what have you. I mean, don't you feel kind of every time you say you're proud now, don't you kind of feel self-conscious? Oh, every totally. time you see a rainbow, totally. don't you feel kind of self-conscious? Oh, yeah, bro. Uh, There's no so, rainbows in my house anymore, bro. No stickers, yeah, nothing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what's funny? Because, I, you know, growing up, like the rainbow was a little puzzle we all had as a kid. Yeah, Remember yeah. that thing where you just like put it? They tarnished it. Right. They yeah, tarnished yeah. It. But, but right, right. you know what's really interesting with stuff is that now me and Shikama have, have been in different parts of the, of the world, the Arab and non-Arab world. And I, I will say this much, okay? I think people under this guise, and I think that, that when you make hijrah or you leave, that everything is going to be exponentially better for you, right? And mm. I think they have to put that in perspective because, look, there are certain, there are definitely going to be problems, especially in the Middle East right. if you go live there. Um, there's going to be a, an adjustment period where you may not have to get, there's no, like, you know, the whole civil process, there's other things. There's going to be problems. But you're not moving right. there for those conveniences. You're moving there right. because you have a, a you want a society that does not glorify degeneracy. Right? That's right. why you're moving right. there. And I think that you can like certain things about Canada or USA and like Absolutely. certain things about the Middle East or other countries as well, too. It doesn't have to be this binary decision where it's yes and no. But, Absolutely. And, and that's my thing. Like, you know, like I know the certain things that I miss about the Middle East, like, you know, just... Right. For example, the ability to be a Muslim and just proudly and not to worry about what you're saying. And like, you know, just even regular people giving you nasiha in public about things that are simple things, you know, like, well, bismillah, you know, things, things that are very simple that you would not get here. It's just like you're, you're on your family. Yeah. Or hearing you're on family. something as simple as hearing the adhan. Yeah. Something so Absolutely. simple, right? Like that. You Absolutely. take for granted. Or, for example, going to any restaurant and having halal food. Yeah. Like these right. are things right. that are that you have a numerous in benefits, right? Uh, or if, right. for example, the family life. We know that in America, sure, in America, I make a lot of money here, right? But the family life is is hectic. 
Mm-hmm. Right? You don't have right. back there. You spend more time with your family. Yeah, it's stressful to be with family. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you notice over here, people eat quickly and they just disperse. Yeah. <laughs> over there, right. like eating is an event. Like you know, you get together, you sit together for hours, you enjoy each other's company, you have shy, whatever. Maybe right. you do enjoy company. And so there's trade offs, right? And I think people right. don't. They're only looking at it from a worldly gain. And I think over there. They think that anyone who's in America, anything you touch in America becomes gold. They think that if right. anyone's been back home or you're going to a visit, they think you're going to bring back bricks of gold to them and say, here, take it. You know, <laughs> we got enough right, money right. here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have this weird perception. I, I, I basically summarized uh, life uh, or my perception of life in uh, uh, you know, the Arab world compared to life in Canada or America. Because I also lived in the U.S. for about five and a half years. So strong language warning. Um, I say that I would rather live in a shithole among the sick than in a hellhole among the damned. Oh, and that's wow. my summary. Oh, I was just going to ask you about that, but you answered it. That's a great quote, by the way. Um, so yeah. you going to use it? I'm, I'm definitely going to use it. Yes. So, no. So verbatim? Not no, maybe not verbatim, but I mean, don't I, I appreciate what he's you going to violate the. He's method an if asterisk you don't do it. in place of the eye, right? <laughs> no, no, he's a <laughs> no, no, he's a poet. So he's he has uh, mashallah, He knows how to use strong language. <laughs> but uh, one thing is uh, the the dilemma that people have. Number one is when they go to a uh, Muslim country or any country other than a Western country is they go with a wrong mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And that's with me having to be around many, many people is they come there and they don't realize how inflated their egos are because I'll Mm -hmm. just say, because I was born and raised in America, if they were from, when they come from America, even if they're originally Indian or wherever they're originally from, right? They, the comparison always happens. So when I used to live in Egypt, I used to kind of have like this routine on like a, every two months, every three months, picking up people from the airport, getting them settled, having them, you know, their apartment kind of ready for them and all that kind of stuff, right? So we used to kind of do that. But one of the things that I even saw guys that would be there with like four children, they would start this whole comparison thing, and even with their family. Oh man, this is nothing like America. If we were in America, oh look how small this toothpaste tube is. Oh, look how, <laughs> like all that kind of stuff, and that's all. Obviously, it comes from. There's Arians, no Fruit right? Loops. No oh, Tamil Loops. Yeah. Oh my God, we tasted their version of Fruit Loops, really, <laughs> and it tastes like perfume. And I was like, man, you're not in America. You came here to leave that to have that understanding. You should have that maturity. You're not in America right now. Right. It's it's a completely different world. It's a different planet, like you said. Right. So I think the first right. thing is before you make any decision to move to a Muslim country or any country other than the country that you believe to be a great country, mm. you're not moving to that country. You're willing to sacrifice something for your dean. That's why you're moving there. Mm-hmm. So you shouldn't go there and have people babysit you mm-hmm. to have you like undo. Like I literally had to sit for like three, four months with some people oh, wow. and c- constantly be with them and babysit them and let them know, look, you're not in America. Dude. You can't. Them. And it's not good for your family either. The dude's got husband, the dude's got a wife and children. Yeah. And they all have these conversations around dinner like oh america was so good and i was like dude, you're not helping your case at all to convince right. your children that their iman can be better over here that's right? a very good point because what happens is you're creating yeah. psychologically you're creating a negative experience exactly by you're not gonna it like it to, yeah and, 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 and i think it's wonderful that you bring it up because i and i think people have this expectation and i'll hear my other thing too okay aside from that there are people on the other end of the spectrum where they realize that they're going to a place that's not going to be as up to par as where they're from yeah but they think at the same time it's going to be this glorious khilafah that they're going to live under yeah, right yeah, yeah. and they get depressed right. when they go there that's and they're true. like oh my god this is they're, they're not, i'm more more muslim in the united states you know what i mean yeah, like yeah, they, they, yeah. they have this thing where they right. think you know there's going to be just munakabat everywhere and guys with beard everywhere and there's going to be like there's no haram in the street and no one's going to invite them yeah. And that's also the opposite extreme, which is not the reality. But what you need to understand is that, generally speaking, the culture itself shuns the general evil that we know of. Yeah. You're going to find people right. All right, who do things. And this, by the way, even happened during the time of the Sahaba. People did things, but it was more private. Yeah. It was more shameful. Yeah. Yeah. There was a to do something like yeah. this in public. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah. And the other thing is that I'm glad you actually bought that. I was just talking to a brother who just visited Egypt, you know, one of, one of a really close friend of mine. And uh, if you stick the course long enough and you have sincerity, you have ikhlas and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, you know, put uh, uh, content in your heart, 
you'll realize, and I was telling him this, you know, one of the first things he said to me, because he's, he's from the UK. One of the first things he said to me is, man, the first taxi driver I bought up, I was reminded of the Iman of the taxi driver. That's what he said to me, right? Mm. And for me, one of the people that I knew who had one of the, like the best stories, even though he was considered illiterate, was my Bawab, right? The person who's basically the gatekeeper of, of the apartment complex that I lived in or the apartment that I lived in. The reason why I'm saying that is, once you have this mindset of, and we used to call it the Sahaba syndrome when we were in Egypt, they just think they're going to go to Muslim countries and see Sahaba all around them or the caliber <laughs> of the Sahaba all around them, right? But if they stick the course long enough, they're going to realize that their mindset of who is a person of Iman changes drastically when they go to a Muslim country. Mm. Drastically, right? right? Mm. And it's always right. the very, very simple people that you're around that probably never studied Sharia a day in their life. They probably some of them don't know how to read and write the way you know how to read and write, even in their own indi indigenous language. But you're going to realize the words that they utter of their experiences of being around other Muslims their whole lives, and some of them even being Bedouins, you're going to realize that those people were the most valuable people to you. Allah Akbar. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and so I think... And actually... That, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, well, one of the greatest blessings, uh, and don't try this at home, uh, one of the greatest blessings that happened off. to me was, uh, uh, as soon as I arrived, I, I basically got married, alhamdulillah, within 40 days of arriving in Jordan. Um, and uh, I married uh, this Bedouin woman, uh, uh, or a woman from the, the Bedouin tribes of Jordan uh, that really loves Jordan from the bottom of her heart. And so, uh, you know, whereas taxi drivers and, and people, you know, right, right, left and center out in the street in Jordan are asking me, you know, why did you come here? Uh, you know, she had she had all the answers. You know, it's Jordan is great. And, you know, in, in her mind, this is this is hyperbole. But in her mind, she kind of thinks that, you know, all Americans really want to be Jordanians, you know, um, you know, <laughs> she did, she never actually said that. But she she loved Jordan. for uh, She loves Jordan from the bottom of her heart. And so that gave me the uh, the, uh, the 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 anchoring that I needed mm -hmm to feel settled, to feel that I had made the right decision. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. she was my partner mm -hmm. in my hijra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if I can ask you just uh, get moving more towards you were moving to a Muslim country is uh, what are some challenges do you think if anybody was to move to Jordan or even I know a lot of brothers are talking about Turkey. That's my next question I wanted to ask you. But in Jordan in specific, um, what are some challenges that people should expect before getting there just to so they're not naive when they get there? What are some challenges that they should definitely expect if they were to come to Jordan right. just to check it out to, if they want to live there or not? Jordan, okay. Jordan is not like Egypt or even Saudi Arabia. It has a very high cost of living. Okay. Mm. So that's... Let's let's get that out of the way. So yeah, yeah you're you're not going to come up you know with some spare change here and and make do like you can in Egypt or even Saudi Arabia um, doesn't have that high of a cost of living if you just want to you know just eat and drink and have simple you know uh, yeah, you know live a simple life. Jordan to live a simple life it's expensive. So the, the, that's the, that's one thing. The dinar just so people know the, the dinar is, is higher than the American dollar as far as value, right? It's pegged. Yes, yeah. it's it's one it's one point four one. Yeah, so it's actually more. So you get less American dollars mm. for one J J J JD. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you had a hundred uh, dollars, a hundred American dollars, you would end up with uh, seventy-one JD. Okay. So a typical Jordanian dinars. A typical, you know, I don't know how often you do groceries or whatever. I mean, I know even amongst the Arab countries are different, but um, in your typical grocery visit, uh, how much are you spending? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> Yeah, that that's a hard one. Uh, especially, uh, you know, I, I basically often just give the money to my wives, and they go and buy the stuff because I can't stand shopping. But um, <laughs> awesome. but th th there 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 is something that I, that I do. I uh, I like adopting the culture that's around me, right? So when Wonderful. I went and visited Nigeria, uh, you you couldn't tell that I wasn't Nigerian other than you know my physical color. features but yeah, yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly but like I, I totally try to become more Nigerian than Nigerians you know what I mean and so I like to adopt the culture so I eat locally so I eat Jordanian foods That's so awesome. I'm not going to have the same costs as uh you know unless they're unhealthy there are some unhealthy uh you know uh, habits they have here but in general their food is better than American food in terms of health. You know what yeah. I mean? What, what does a Jordanian have for breakfast? What, what do you guys have for breakfast? Let me ask you that. I don't eat breakfast. I skip it. Okay. Yeah, I don't eat anything. So, 
No, uh, intermittent fasting. No, but you, you guys just want to, don't want to say fruit loops. But, but the, yeah, <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, no, wait. On the day that I'm hungry, I, yeah, I will have like frosted flakes or fruit loops or <laughs> exactly. cinnamon toast exactly. crunch. And, and yeah, the grown yeah. man? I, I, I eat, oh, yeah, I eat all the kids cereals. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? What, you, you, you eat regular boring cornflakes? No, I eat eggs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, good, good. I, I eat okay. eggs, um, eggs and toast. Yeah, but yeah. then I have a bowl of cereal right, too. Right. Okay, great. So in general, in general, Jordanian food is uh, is healthier than American food uh, as a uh, as a as a as a general principle. And also, if you eat like a local, you're going to keep your costs down. Um, it's exactly. not like eating uh, like, for example, if you if you if you want to go out and buy Frosted Flakes or whatever, that's going to be costly. Um, and so I, I typically try to adopt uh, local customs wherever I go, um, as long as they don't. Uh, so some with bread the and maybe some food and some so, jibna. Uh, yeah, and and uh, and uh, hummus and, yeah. and falafel. But that mansif must be uh, heavy, so... though. <laughs> that mansif every night must uh, yeah. be heavy. Mansif, mansif isn't a daily dish. Mansif uh, I hope is, not. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, it's a it's a formal dish. So 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 cost of living is 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 one such thing. Uh, but there are other challenges as well. The other challenges uh, are that if you want to settle here, getting a a, 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 a legal residency can be a challenge and if you don't have legal residency uh then you can't get your kids officially into schools mm. like unless you're an Arab, uh, unless you have an arab citizenship and uh, effectively i don't i, I mean I'm, i don't really have an egyptian citizenship mm. um even though i'm ethnically egyptian and so getting your kids into schools means that you have to have uh, uh, uh means that you have to have uh, an actual uh, legal residency. There's no path for men. There's no path to uh, to citizenship, right? And so, uh, for women, if a if a woman marries a Jordanian man, she becomes a citizen. If a man, I married two Jordanian women. I uh, I don't get citizenship out of that. Um, and so, uh, the, so these are some challenges that you'll face. So, what's the process uh, issues... though of getting a legal a legal residency? Is it a, is it a legal tedious resi- process? It you have to fit in one of uh, a number of categories. Your employer can offer it. Mm. Um, that's that's uh, that's one possibility. But finding a job here is also difficult without a national ID number, meaning being a citizen, right? Um, and so those are those are the the real challenges. So if you're single and you have a job that you can do remotely, uh, or your you know your kids have grown up. Um, uh, or you figured out homeschooling, and and you know that this will this will work from uh, wherever your kids are at now yes. until they leave Jordan. Then more power to you. But if you don't, if you aren't one of those people, and you need your kids to go to school, um, then you will face challenges here. So so, uh, so yeah. How is so it, residency, how, citizenship, they're all difficult here. How is the Jordanian government, as far as you know, rules and regulations with? Um, uh, you know, for instance, Americans or Westerners having a remote job, uh, working American, basically for an American company in America, but working remotely. Do you know anybody that does that? Do you know if they have to go through any hurdles for doing that? Everyone does that. What do, we, what do you mean? Do I know anyone? Everyone does that. I mean, all the Americans that live here basically do that because unless you're like teaching English or, 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 or some other very specific job here, um, you can't find a job in jordan as a uh, without a national id number and so the, most of them are, are the people in the corruption community uh, had a uh, had a uh, a large a large portion of them were working remotely or 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 do re, uh, or do remote work yeah because when we were looking into turkey turkey actually has a dilemma with you earning money outside of turkey and that you have to actually go through a lot of loops and hoops in order to even try that that's actually oh, a very really? difficult process yeah it's a very difficult process yeah. if somebody is an american citizen having a job in america bringing in american money into turkey right so the i for americans in particular i mean i don't i don't um i don't suffer from this issue because i'm not an american citizen uh <laughs> but the irs uh wants their cut no matter what yeah so i do have an american Call, I have two American colleagues, and so they do have to report their income. But it's kind of the opposite. They have Jordanian jobs, uh, and so they have to report their income to the U.S. Yeah, um, I mean, I mean no so, matter where you live, you have to give the federal money their money. So the federal taxes, right. income tax will always be there. You won't pay the Even state. Even if you have a job in Jordan yes. getting paid by Jordanians? Yes, yes, because they, look, you have a cost of citizenship, bro. You're an American. Mm. <laughs> that passport costs you money, right? And they have to get their taxes because right. they're still maintaining your borders and protecting your country. It's still yeah. theoretically your country, mm, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And because, right. 
if something were to happen to you in Jordan or whatever other country, <laughs> the, the state office would then represent you, right? You still have all these benefits right. of an American, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? If you have kids that are taken away from you, they have extradition laws, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But you won't pay state income tax. Or you may not have to pay things like Medicare or, or I'm sorry, a, a local state, um, like, um, you know, unemployment stuff. You may not have to do that. But on the federal level, Got yeah, it. unless you Got denounce it. your citizenship, by the way, which costs you money, too. You can't just do it. Dang, dang. Yeah. Did you, did you ever regret going? Uh, did you ever have, like, second thoughts or any type of issues that ended up uh, trying to make making life difficult and you... Uh, were contemplating at uh, once yeah, to leave and... Yeah, I thought about coming back. Uh, I mean, maybe briefly when I first uh, when I had first arrived in Jordan and saw the uh, you know the the situation that I was in with no wife and uh, and three kids at home and putting my kids through school and uh, and uh, inheriting a bit of a an IT mess at the company that I started working at, but uh, not for long. My, uh, Alhamdulillah, no, I I. I I mean, other than like fleeting thoughts, um, I've pretty much always been convinced that, you know, alhamdulillah, I made the right decision and, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here, alhamdulillah. I mean, I, I realize that, uh, look, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, a caliphate and it's, and it's not, uh, uh, and what, what did you call it? Sahaba? Sahaba syndrome? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, no, I, I kind of knew that because I had visited Arab countries, um, uh, prior to moving to Jordan, but would I choose anything else? No. Oh, another challenge about Jordan is uh, uh, a lot of the houses don't have uh, insulation, so you always uh, feel the cold and the heat more than you do in uh, in uh, in North America at the very least. Mm, and I'm pretty sure the cost of AC, if you run your AC, is pretty expensive, right? The electricity and all that. Yep. So yep. one thing I noticed about people don't realize too is that being in certain Middle East countries, like when I was overseas, it's so hot sometimes that the actual hot water heater yeah. is actually not used for hot water. It's actually used to cool the water because <laughs> it actually right. because the water goes in there. Because if you take it from straight from the pipe, it's gonna scorch you. I mean, it's gonna burn you. So the water yeah. sits in this tank and gets cool, and then you have to use that water. And the minute you don't, you're gonna burn your. You're you gonna know, burn they have your that body. Saudi too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's all over. But but let me ask you this though. Uh, I'm very curious because uh, what was what was the reason why you didn't go to Brunei? Brunei seems like such a great place to have shit. Yeah, they're trying to put like some stuff down. They're they're putting their stance. They're pretty wealthy guys running the country. But I mean, what was that process like, though? I mean, uh, what, did it not work out for your own reasons, or because they wouldn't allow it? Oh, I'm 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 much simpler than you think. I applied for a job, and they said no. Ah, hmm. so, okay. sorry, it's it wasn't a, it was a lame ending, you know. No, that's fine. My Not next, very exciting. My next, yeah. sorry, we're just rapid firing now, but I really wanted to get your take on Turkey and people moving to Turkey. If I'm pretty sure you have, you know, some people that you know that probably are in Turkey that you're in connection with, and how would you compare and contrast with Jordan and like somebody moving to Turkey? I, I wouldn't know because I, 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 I visited Turkey, but I've never lived there. Um, it's not my cup of tea. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, that's, that's, I, I guess I, uh, yeah, I, I, it, 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 it's not for me. It's no, not for me. That's fine. Yeah. That's totally yeah, I cool. kind of feel yeah. that, you know, I, I, think, I, 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 I feel yeah, that the culture isn't conservative enough. enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, so you feel Jordan's yeah. a little more conservative where you are. It's not a little more. It's way more conservative. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't know that. You, 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 you don't have you don't have men and women kissing in the streets in Jordan. Hmm. You know that's the, true, the, actually. They're the European yeah, yeah. side of Istanbul, yes, 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 right? Of course, so of we're not talking about villages in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. I keep thinking of kind the of like places Romania where people go, places, like yeah, Antalya, yeah. Istanbul. These are very touristy. Like, keep in mind, like it's Europe. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not even like thinking about like, Istanbul. I'm talking about more like you know, like Konya. Yeah, and but then, but like... then again, when you go in those areas, there's a huge problem for most people. Like, most people can probably get by in some form of Arabic. Turkish is a whole different yeah, language. True, very true. Very true. Right. right. And, yeah. I mean, and so that's always a problem. However, I have heard that because of the whole Syrian crisis, there have been many Syrians that have moved in certain town areas. Yes, yes, yes. And they're predominantly Arabic speaking. Like, I mean, they, they've pretty been taken mm. over. So maybe those areas. But mm. certainly in like Turkey, and by the way, Turkish is not an easy language to learn. It's not, yeah. Because right. apparently the, the ver or the, the adjectives just get added to the noun. So you can have words that are like, super long right <laughs> i keep going on and on and on right yeah, so, a lot of yeah yeah so super cali 
Fraggle Yeah, Fraggle Fraggle something Fraggle like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what the? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. But, but anyways, uh, yeah, but I was curious because Bunai seems like a pretty cool spot. It's off the grid. It's kind of a way to do their own yeah. thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's pretty, seems pretty nice and toasty. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. What's kind of funny is that uh, during uh, my that whole period in the in the in the mid to late nineties, when I was uh, trying to find a place to live, uh, I, I prayed a number of istikharas about living in Syria, and they would always be negative. I'd be like, "But why? Syria is such a great place." <laughs> you know? yeah. And then uh, you know, I, I, I'm not. I'm not. Of course, you know, um, I'm not mocking what happened in Syria. I'm, I'm sad for what happened. But you know. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and, and we don't know. Of so, yeah. And so I had like basically one more question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that's a reason why a lot of people, um, when if they do plan on moving somewhere, they should definitely seek out somebody or Westerners that have built kind of a network there. I think that's what, I think that's kind of when, if somebody was to move to Karabcha, they basically have a bunch of people that are kind of going to help them out and show them the strength so they don't have to just, you know, Lone Ranger it. You know what I'm saying? Right? Right. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is that uh, now nowadays, if you move to any capital city of, you know, possibly with the exception of something like Mauritania, uh, you know, if you if you move to the capital city of any Arab country, uh, you do you can contact a bunch of Westerners that live there already, and uh, and and everything's online now. Everything's mm. online, so you can find out what life will be like before you even arrive. Yeah, they have expat forums now. But, you know, I would say this, though. For anyone that's thinking about making the hijrah in their mind, I would say before you make any plans, right, just go there yourself for a week or two. Mm. Take some time right. off from your regular life. Go there and see how it is and see if you fit in. And there's no problem with saying you don't fit in a particular place. You can go to another place and see it. Yeah. But make that because what you think about a place and what you actually encounter are two different things Comes always right like and that's yeah. a lot of time expectations can be different so when you're there for like a week and two weeks not on vacation and not on work but you're there just to see how your daily living is that would give you a perspective into whether you fit in or yeah. not and because I was, it, it, yeah. it can be very exciting because you think this is it before you even go never have that mindset because you're always going to be disappointed. right so if you can i yeah. mean if, if it's a i would say go there and 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 possibly you know um just take a a, a week there and see how it is to live there and secondly i would say while it's good to be in contact with uh maybe if you're an american other americans or foreigners that are there um i would say that it's better if you try to be more locally involved because what happens is you have pockets of people that are like from their own area yeah. And then you totally lose the, the experience of having to be in a different place Very true, yeah. right and then right. so you get caught in like just that whole bubble yeah. Right, and then it becomes. But when you when you get, it's hard. But when you get to know the locals, your like your, your social life is expanded. Your connections are expanded. Yeah. Your know how is expanded. Yeah. When you live in a bubble, you're in a bubble, right? Yeah. You, that's just like living in America, right? Yeah. If you only talk to Americans, live with Americans, stay in right. American neighborhoods, eat American foods, yeah. oh, I guess the restaurant, they oh, great American burgers, right? That's how you're gonna be. You're gonna yeah. think you're not gonna get out of that mind stuff, and then you're gonna start missing America more. Yeah. But not only that, we have to expect. Look, just because you move somewhere because you think it's gonna be better for your iman and your family, we have to get out of this mindset that there's not gonna be any issues or problems. There might be even more, right. more, especially temporary. Like, the, how many people have you met that traveled and they were planning on staying there for a year, but they're like, man, I want to leave after like two months. Mm -hmm. You're gonna to have to go through that phase, and you're not. And the worst part is you have fun, some that go and they move to a place, a neighborhood that's totally American. <laughs> like they have like. You know, a gated community is like, what was yeah. the purpose of this, bro? Like, what was the purpose of doing this? Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Because I found in the Middle East, especially when you have American schools, right. you have the kids that, if you have children, the kids that go to American schools, they want to be American. Uh, let me let me be very They're clear. more American than Americans, I was bro. just going to say that. Like, I have relatives that live overseas, and those, they're more American than I am when I go there and talk to them. They know more about what's going on, the music, the culture. I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> no idea, even right. slang. So you have to be yeah. kind of mindful of that too. Like there's a huge, <clears throat> what they think about America and how you feel about America are two different things. Very different. So if you're in the wrong crowd or the wrong group of people, uh, you know, it might not work the way you think it's yeah, going to work. Yeah. 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 Well, let's um, start Mustafa. What, what else uh, are you doing right now in relation to the Royal Islamic uh, studies? Is. Strategic Study Center. Um, so I gave uh, up after three words. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, uh, I translate books, um, and I uh, 
I, I do research and uh, uh, on uh, on Islamic topics, uh, some of which I can talk about, some of which I, I can't talk about. Some uh, I do some ghost writing, but I also have my own side projects. And uh, if if it's okay to do a shameless plug, of course, um, we like them. So. Uh, so, uh, inshallah, I will be teaching a course through Siblings of Ilm, uh, a UK-based uh, online institute on the Mu'allaqa, or hanging ode, of Amtara. So, as Ooh. you know, there were seven to ten, depending on uh, on uh, who gathered or who compiled the poems. Seven to ten classical Arabic poems from the Jahiliya, from the time before Islam. And uh, uh, I'll be teaching one of those through... Uh, 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 through siblings of Ilm, uh, inshallah. And, and in case anyone, is it? How much time do we have? Can I? Can I? Pump we have as, ma- as, about, we as, have as much, much time as you want. want. Yeah. If you okay. can go for so, another half an hour, we're down. Okay. Uh, I, I'll just uh, uh, say what I think needs to be said here. That he, here's the issue uh, regarding uh, the preservation of the Arabic language. Uh, regarding the Arabic language, uh, so. If we look at, for example, something, uh, the natural tendency is for languages to change, right? So if you look at English from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, from the, 14, the 13 and 1400s, you're, it sounded like, right? And that's from the 1400s. If you look at the time of around Imr al Qais, English was actually. Anglo-Saxon. It was a Germanic language. It was a uh, it was a, uh, a a language that doesn't resemble its current form whatsoever, right? And so that's a natural tendency. So what happened is that Arabic was preserved, but it was preserved remarkably well because non-religious texts were preserved as well. So if we look at, for example, mm. I mean, uh, if we compare ourselves to the closest. Uh, religion uh, and and ethnicity to us uh the jewish people right if we look, so they, they had other challenges obviously uh because they lived among non um uh, uh non-semitic people so they lost parts of their languages uh parts of their language but in addition to that um nothing of non-devotional biblical hebrew was preserved the only Biblical, the only biblical Hebrew texts that were preserved uh, in any form, and I'm not saying they were preserved completely, were devotional texts. And if you try to imagine that there's this kid that grows up in China, um, and he wants to understand Shakespeare, and all he's ever going to read is Shakespeare, and he wants to understand Shakespeare. How does his understanding compare to someone who's read English in general and read uh, Shakespeare's contemporaries and then goes and reads Shakespeare, right? And so the idea is that uh, to understand uh, what happened is that the miracle of the preservation of Arabic is that we preserved non-devotional texts so that when you see that, for example, mm-hmm. Imr al-Qais, when he talks about taqwa, uh, or sorry, uh, when he talks about afu, Right, which we'll say, oh, Afu means amnesty or pardon, right? But what does it actually mean? It, mean? it actually means erasure. So he's he's using the word Afu in the context of uh, wind covering up the tracks of camels and of people in the sand, right? And when Tarafa uses the word Taqwa, he's talking about his female camel using her tail to protect herself so she doesn't get jumped by a male camel, right? So she's protecting herself with that tail, right? And so a lot of these words... What I want us to be able to do and what we really need to be able to do to understand the Qur'an is to go into the mindset of pre-Islamic times and understand words as the Sahaba first heard them, mm. as, as, the, you know, as, as revelation came to them and as they heard it, what did it sound like? What did it mean to them? What does taqwa mean? What does qunut mean? Uh, what does afu mean? Uh, what does salah mean? What are all these things? It's like there's a there's actually a hadith where the sahaba uh, were going out, radiallahu anhum, um, and they were looking for, uh, they were out on a on a mission, and they were looking for food and water. And they found a, uh, a woman who had a huge uh, water bag um, and some food. And uh, they told her, جِئْنَاكِ مِنْ عِنْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the woman asked, مَاذَا رَسُولُ الله? She knew what the words meant, but she, she said, what is the messenger of Allah? They said, we've come to you from the messenger of Allah. So they knew that there were messengers, kings and, and important people had messengers. And she knew what Allah meant, but she didn't, she didn't quite get what is the messenger of Allah. You know what I mean? What's and the concept? So, yes. Yeah, exactly. This this concept was strange to her. And so really understanding Arabic um, 
Uh, to, to understand Arabic properly, you have to understand, or to understand the Quran rather properly, you have to understand the language of the of the people mm -hmm. that it was, uh, or, or the language of those people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so, and these were poems that were recited. And what you find in works of tafsir is they will quote these poems. Mm -hmm. Right? There's there's a certain period of time called Asr al-Hijaj or the authoritative era, which is basically approximately okay, 150 before uh, Hijrah to 150 after Hijrah, where uh, and and people from certain areas spoke the most uh, eloquent or, or, or what is canonical classical Arabic. And, and there are a variety of dialects there. And so learning uh, these, uh, studying these poems is critical to understand the Quran. Um, and to understand uh, 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 to understand the hadith literature as well, because hadith literature incorporates even uh, a wider variety of uh, dialects and terms. And so uh, uh, it's it's enjoyable, um, but it's also beneficial. And so, inshallah, I'll be teaching that course uh, Amtara's Mu'allaqan. Hopefully, Ya Rab, uh, uh, yeah. we'll finish all of the Mu'allaqat. We'd I mean. love to. I'd love to to join that. But yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because I know that traditionally, like the classical Mufassirin, they had to know the uh, extra religious poetry and they had to know the language Absolutely. in order to make right. the tafsir of the Quran. But it's also interesting to note that Islam is so unique that the Quran actually redefines terms that the Arabs traditionally right. thought meant certain things, but it redefined it. For example, you mentioned Salah. It redefined yes. how they understood this word. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Tawbah. Observation, and yeah. Talaq. And things, things like that. They, they, they knew, but they redefined that entire uh, Arabic language at that time. I always thought that right. the Quran defeated poetry, and I never thought about studying it at all. Because that's what the teacher mm -hmm. said back then, you know, when we were young. Yeah, no, they didn't say defeated. So I, I know what you're talking about, and there's a misconception around that. So what he's referring to is that if one wants to understand the Quran the way it's supposed to be understood, mm -hmm. the era that preceded revelation must be understood to get the full picture, right? Gotcha. So what right. some people would refer would be referring to is even in the Mu'alaqat al Sabah and the Ashara that he was referring to, you know, the the what there's some things in there that are not something that's gonna there's there's poems let me just say in general that are going to be actually something that's completely devoid of understanding allah right and mm. certain things that are just can if somebody doesn't understand why they're reading it it can be completely abhorrent and they can just put it down and be like this is disgusting this is fahisha i'm not going to read this right there's mm. complete lewdness mm. right but it's it's the structure of the language itself which made somebody understand and I'll try to, and if I'm making any mistake, uh, Ustaz, please let me know, inshallah. No, that, you're doing a better job than I could. No. <laughs> please. Astaghfirullah, man. The, the, even the more eloquent, so my teacher actually told me something really beautiful that always stuck with me. He said, Islamic poetry and eloquence and balagha has to be studied in order to understand the Quran for multiple reasons. Number one, you have to know the language, what made people prominent and gave them their linguistic prowess. Mm. That's what made the Arabs, and now they get revelation from Muhammad who was unlettered and see the difference in the language. So number mm -hmm. one, there's a distinction between the language. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the human being, the more eloquent they become on this worldly level, and they will try to match the level of the Quran, the farther they will, and the human realm become a lot more eloquent, eloquent. But on the level of the Quran, they're actually going to be pulling farther and farther away from the structure of the language in the Quran. So what I mean by that is, let's say somebody is very, very, very eloquent. And right now, for instance, since you're talking about the Mu'allaqat, we'll talk about the Mu'allaqat al Sabah, right? Or even the Ashara. Mm -hmm. So listen to what Umar al-Qais says, right? Just listen to the difference in the language, right? He says, right? Now, somebody who doesn't understand Arabic, right, proficiently, now just listen to what I just said in this. Now, one thing that you'll understand from this is, even though this has so, the, the poems had so much structure and so much eloquence, there's actually somebody who doesn't understand the language, they'll be able to understand just by the way the words in the Quran are, there's a lot more relief in listening to the Quran. Like, listen to the word, like the, the, the word that Uthman died reciting or claimed to be, where 
Allah says in the Quran, mm. Right? Fasayakfikahumullah. So Allah is going to be suffice for you against them. That's a very general understanding in English. It's almost a butchered translation, but just live with this for a moment. So Allah is going to be sufficient for you amongst them. And who's Uthman radiallahu an fighting against at this time? So many factions, right? Yeah. And he's repeating this verse over and over again. And if you study Balagha, right, you'll understand that the the relief that this phrase, multiple words, which seems to be one word to an English speaker, is actually internally going to bring you lots of relief. And the it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this for every every moment that somebody is going to be just surrounded by all types of enemies on all levels and this word is going to pass this phrase is going to pacify them and the word happens to mean Allah is going to be enough for you around them or, or for them or, or, or whatever they're imposing upon you and just listen to how beautiful that sounds fasayak fikahumullah right it actually has a very beautiful uh pacifying so you're saying it's soothing relief. as well soothing is the word I'm looking for right yeah. so one thing is that the other reasons, and the reason I mentioned all that is, the Mufassirin also make us understand of why even like Imam Al-Qurtubi has so much poetry in almost every page of his tafsir, is that all these things, number one, are a prerequisite to understand the Qur'an and look how it's used with the Arabs, look how it's used, so that's why these are the meanings of this word in the Qur'an. But look at structurally, just on almost like a spiritual level. Structurally, the more eloquent we get as human beings, as with, with Arabic is concerned, now compare it also just on a comparative level to the quran itself right and that brings the human being and i think that's what he's actually referring to in this course is that any muslim that wants to study the quran they have to understand what preceded revelation right, right. in order to get that full understanding not just on a spiritual level but on a linguistic level and it gives them depth right so i think this is something that yeah. I'd, I'd love to so, sign up so, for so can, can i demo that yeah. for the listeners real quick so basically if you want to know what why a wagyu steak is so good you gotta have a crappy steak <laughs> that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> yeah uh, but uh, it's not just at the linguistic level uh, uh but course. also even at the moral level like when you when you see what antara went through um uh and and how he uh, uh how he struggled to avenge uh, or, or or rather to vindicate himself and when you see how uh for example someone like amr ibn kulthum his boasting right and then and then you hear the message of uh of the quran and even the words of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam um uh just the the the, the uh, or Tarafa's searching uh, his fatalism of what does life even mean and so maybe we should just grab the moment and enjoy every single moment um you know in in in, in pure you know hedonistic pleasure uh because life's going to end anyway and so we should just you know have fun and and, and make a, a reputation for ourselves as generous people so we live on um you know, just just the, the struggles that they had, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Then when you you, you hear the message, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنْفُسِهِمْ. You really get it. You really get that the human condition, you know, was is, was just pitiful hmm. before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent us uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or sent prophets in general. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And and when is this no. taking place? This uh, the course. When are you beginning this course in the UK? Uh, yeah, it's beginning at the. Uh, it's online, so it, it begins uh, the. Uh, I think the first Friday of July. It's it's a couple. Uh, so July eighth is that is that a Friday? July eighth. Uh, so it's it's the it's the Friday before Eid al Adha. Um, yeah. And so they're live sessions, and then they'll be recorded. Oh, cool! Uh, inshallah. No. Do we have to register for this, or yeah, is this going to be a, made available? Uh, you do have to register. Yes. Do you get a discount because we're on the show? Hey, bro. Don't be asking. Uh, I will. I, 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 I will. I will. I will talk to. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't pay. Uh, do not give him a discount, yeah, please, no brother. Discount. Please, no discount. Please. Do us a personal favor. Yeah. Yeah. And do not give him a discount. No discount. <laughs> give it to. Give it a discount to people who can't afford. We'll be. We'll be good with that. Inshallah. Yeah. And, and also, uh, inshallah, hopefully uh, later this year we'll be offering. Uh, uh, not through siblings of Adam, but something personally, my own brand that I'm developing along with uh, 
my neighbor, uh, who owns these books. Um, uh, <laughs> Thank you, neighbor. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so I don't know if he wants his name to be known, so that's the way I'm not mentioning it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, so in any case, uh, we'll be developing a, Mus uh, a Muslim masculinity series. So it'll talk about uh, basically uh, sex ed, uh, polygamy, um, and uh, and raise, uh, masculinity and raising children. So we'll we'll basically uh, be discussing uh, those topics. And so make sure to follow me on Facebook, even though I'm in Facebook jail for the next thirty days. Yeah. Oh, you are. Yeah, yes. yeah, they put me in jail today because someone asked. So, what do you do when you've mul uh, you, and you've said multiple times not to use your phone during the khutbah, and uh, uh, and and a kid keeps using his phone? So I said, you get a high power Nerf gun and you shoot him in the forehead. <laughs> and so I guess they, uh, I guess they considered that you know uh, inciting violence. You know, uh, I'd love it. You know what I mean? Uh, I want to tell you something. The, the only substitute for artificial intelligence is natural stupidity. <laughs> Natural stupidity. I like it. No, and I think that's th those are one of the themes that we would really love to have you on again. And I'm just gonna say, I'm not just saying this. I, I really mean this, man. You're you're very awesome and easy guy to talk to. A lot of times when you see people, mashallah, with credentials uh, that you have, you get a little intimidated. You're like, oh, am I gonna make them, you know, feel uncomfortable with some of the stuff I'm gonna say? But man, this was a great experience, and I I really really think we'd really need to book you again because. Um, that's something that one of one of our brothers here, uh, by the name of Dawood Walid, he wrote a book called Futua, and he has a Futua program, and that's something that I'm really really interested in. I would love to know how right. your mind, you know, works uh, regarding that and how you would make that manifest. So I'm super interested in. Welcome this. to the Akrite. Yeah, and I know we. I, mean, I think we should have you on even <laughs> no even before you even launch yeah. this and during and after. I think you'd be a great addition to some of these episodes. Yeah, right? I think we have to do a lot more episodes because I think uh, you know we do need to uh, focus on um, Rajula and you know in general. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. with this whole new agenda coming out. Um. Some people, you know, they get pissed at us for, for uh, you know, speaking about that, or whatever, because they want to push a certain narrative. But I think it's important if we want to protect our generations. And I think, uh, inshallah, I think Absolutely. I'm looking forward to, to the project you're going to do. Uh, I think we need more voices that have, that are qualified. Like, I, I, I'm i a jahad. I know, like, for real. Like, you I don't have any. Are, no, 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 I'm not. You have qualifications. I don't, right? Okay. Mashallah, he has qualifications. So we need people who have qualifations to be able. No, I'm serious. Stop laughing. It's not right. a joking matter. <laughs> you need people that have qualified to speak about it because they have, no, they carry a no, presence. No, mean, yeah. It carries weight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for having me. No, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are, um, you, our platform is your platform, basically. So if you are ever doing anything, please uh, let us know. I know you're uh, translating a lot of books and stuff. So um, right. may, where, where can we even see where you, what books you've translated? Because I tried to look that up. I couldn't find it. I think it's on the Royal website, yeah. right? Uh, so there, there are, uh, there are uh, about uh, four short publications on the risk.jo r i w s c dot jo um you will find one as well um uh, if you search on amazon a translation of il biri uh he has a didactic poem on akhlaq um or you could say basically sufism but uh nothing uh, uh, that that uh, salafi would find objectionable i mean it's what we would call su sufism but it's basically just akhlaq and and spirituality as well inshallah hopefully uh, so later this year, um, the al of Imam Iraqi uh, in Sira, uh, so this thousand-line didactic poem, Alhamdulillah, I've translated into iambic pentameter, and hopefully that will be coming out. Wow. Um, uh, How long did that yeah. take you, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, we can, you have one of two choices. You can ask that question again, or we can remain friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, if, if, if uh, I think you wouldn't mind uh, mentioning, uh, I mean, mentioning his name, um, Dr. Salah Sharif, the, uh, the owner of Wordsmiths, if he dies young, it'll be partly my doing because of <laughs> how, how, how much I stress him Also, uh, <laughs> my friend here uh, reminded me that I translated Ayuh al walad um, wow, uh, Walad, yeah. uh, oh, son. So yeah, these by, are all yeah, available Imam on Hazari. Amazon. Is that what you said? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, only El Biri is available on okay. Amazon. Um, uh, if you uh, Google so maybe, Oh, son. Wait, what you can do is if you provide a name, it should come up. 
Yeah, if you provide us links to so where people can get this, we can include it in the in the video here, so people can you know just get. Honestly, content. I would Google it. So I'll tell you how to Google it. You just write Osan Ghazali Al Qabani, oh. and it'll Thanks come up. Thanks for teaching us how to Google. We never knew how to do that. <laughs> yes. No, but honestly, I don't know. I don't have the links ready. Or, okay, yeah, or, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, no problem. Yeah. Fine. Well, anyway, um, I, I'm sorry. I was I wasn't trying to be a jerk. It just comes. No, out. no. You have to be like this sometimes with us because we know that it's you're okay, like us. I'm but... a jerk. I get it. So it's okay. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all like-minded, so it's great. We love it. Keep doing Alhamdulillah. it. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Again, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, at least uh, evening your time. Um, if she, uh, any listeners uh, have any questions or comments, uh, they, or sorry, if the listeners want to get a hold of you, you're mainly you're, you're on Facebook, right? You're correct. So reach out to Mustafa on Facebook, uh, and you can. Uh, join his Arabic class through that. I'm sure you have some links on some posts. For... Uh, if they write to me, I will, uh, or they, if they just go Google siblings of Alam, they'll find the course okay. there. That's what uh, I mean. Inshallah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's our show for this afternoon. We'll see you all next time. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.